Um, so in pulling this together, um, I was asked to talk about uh, TEXA and standards. And I, in, in thinking about what the role of standards was, I, I went back to kind of my engineering experience and uh, was contemplating the notion of standards as, as scaffold in terms of scaffolding learning. And I thought about the other meaning of scaffold as well as a place of execution. So I thought it was sort of quite a nice way to conceptualise what standards might mean for us. Um, so what I want to cover is just a bit of a historical view of standards based on the engineering experience uh, and make some parallels there. Talk about really where the impetus for higher education standards has come from. And, and Ross alluded to some of that in his talk. Um, talk about what we've got and give my view on what are some of the likely effects. And hopefully stick to time. Um, so historical view, I, you know, the, the issue of actually wanting to regulate industries is not a new thing. So go back to a couple of thousand years BC, uh, the Code of Hammurabi. If a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built fall in and kill its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. So you can see <laughs> a regulation and a desire to restrain the market is not a new thing. Um, go back to engineering, this is a, a, a lithograph, I think, of the Tay Bridge disaster, which is a very famous disaster in, in Scotland and was quite pivotal in actually pushing engineering design forward. Um, the actual causes of the thing were a, a combination of a lack of understanding of wind loading, carelessness on the part of the engineers, and particularly carelessness on the part of the construction process, so a lack of attention to detail. <coughs> uh, a major disaster, I can't remember the, the, the death figures, but I think there were some hundreds of people killed and it was a, you know, a significant moment in, in civil engineering. Um, and what happened then was that regulation started to emerge and of course people said, well, we need something to, to restrain this kind of practice. And uh, same kinds of tensions that I think we're seeing. So this is Isambard King in Brunel, that's a statue of him in Bristol, um, saying, I'm opposed to the laying down of rules or conditions to be observed in the construction of bridges, lest the progress of improvement tomorrow might be embarrassed or shackled by recording or registering as law the prejudices or errors of today. And that could be Deputy Vice Chancellor's academic speaking. Now, I think. But, uh, and as you can see, that was actually after another bridge collapse. So you know, these were serious issues with, with people being killed. Um, I went back to uh, look for some quotes. This is from my old head of department and dean of engineering. And I thought this was actually quite a nice quote. Uh, he wrote a book called The Nature, David Blockley, The Nature of Structural Design and Safety. So this is from 1980. But what he said was, it may be argued, therefore, that engineering has been through three phases, a craft, a craft with science, and a craft with science and regulations. And I thought that was actually quite a nice way to put it, because I think in, in higher education, we've been in a craft basis. We're moving to a craft with regulations. And we haven't really had the science phases yet very much. I mean, it, you know, the, this institute is part of a scientific approach to higher education. But I think it would be tough to argue that we've been a scientifically based industry up to this point. So I thought that was just a, an interesting little thought. Um, I guess the, uh, you know, the recent debates about learning analytics through learning management systems perhaps is a view that we need to be somewhat more scientific about diagnosing and learning. So, uh, why do we have standards in higher education now? Um, Ross alluded to this, but the Bradley Review certainly didn't create competition in the sector, but is, but is going to facilitate and regulate it. So I think Denise Bradley was very mindful that we were already getting a lot of competition coming into the sector between universities, uh, from private providers, uh, from other people coming into the space. And I think what the panel saw was that we really needed to get a, a good regulatory base in place so that as that competition increased, we wouldn't be subject to the kind of bridge collapses and, and those kinds of things. And the other is a, a sort of general unease about quality, um, I guess. So what do we mean by quality? Um, these are, this is not exhaustive or particularly scholarly, but um, here are six things that you might argue quality is about. Exclusiveness, in other words, the idea of universities is a place where smart people go to think. Uh, the idea of research output and prestige as being a measure of quality in some way. Level of resourcing, Ross alluded to this. Uh, graduate capabilities, what students can actually do when they leave. Formal quality assurance processes and formal quality enhancement processes. And if you think about what's happened to those over the last couple of decades, I guess, you know, undoubtedly, exclusiveness has gone down. It's absolutely unarguable. We've gone from having a few percent of the population involved to you know, aiming for 40 percent of the population. As Ross was saying, I happen to think that that's a great thing. I don't see that as a loss. But if, but if, you're, if that's your definition of quality, inevitably it's reduced. Research output has gone up massively, uh, both in terms of per publications and the involvement of people in the sector. So it's difficult to argue that quality has gone down on that basis. But the relative prestige of research publication probably has reduced just because the volumes have gone up. 
level of resource here, bit of a confused picture here. Uh, after the Howard government came in, we did get heavily squeezed for uh, One of the graphs in the base funding review showed that, and I think this depends on how you count it, that in 2007 we were back to 1996 in terms of dollars per ethyl, but some of that was with strings of tie. <coughs> and you know, where are we going in the future? Uh, as Ross has said, the, the notion that we're going to get 10% I think is unlikely. And if, as seems increasingly likely, a coalition government is elected, I think the signals are that we will not be going upwards. Um, graduate capabilities. I put a couple of question marks there because, I, you know, this is an interesting debate. I, I lost this, but Gavin Moody made a lovely comment in one of the, uh, the follow-ups to one of the Australian stories where he pointed out that the things that are currently examined at first year in, uh, currently examined in high school, sorry, in maths, used to be taught in third year university. So, you know, standards are not invariant. We tend to, there is a sort of a, a, a discourse which bemoans the loss of standards, but I think goes back to that idea of exclusiveness. But in fact, you know, an example I use a lot in civil engineering is finite element analysis, which simply didn't exist in 1940, but now is a core part of the curriculum. So, you know, things change over time. Um, we do need to worry a lot about graduate capability, <coughs> but, um, but you can't look at it and say they've gone down or up. The major concern there, I think, is about English standards for international students, and certainly Chris Evans, that was one of his hot buttons in terms of uh, worrying about what quality meant in the sector. Uh, formal quality assurance processes and formal quality enhancement processes, particularly engendered by things like AWQA, again, I think it would be very difficult to say that we haven't done a lot better on that. I've got as many uh, double negatives as Ross had, I think, that you know, we've, we've done very much better on QA and and QE over the last couple of decades, I think, and we, we're vastly more professional in that space than we ever were before. So I think it's, you know, you'd have to say that those are better. So despite all of that, there is a general angst about quality. You hear it a lot, and I think Ross you know, nailed it. We actually create a lot of that, because we do go to the government and say, if you don't give us more money, quality will go down. So <laughs> we've created this discourse of angst, which means then we're now getting regulation to, to regulate the thing we say is a problem. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, I think we couldn't confidently say that we can prove that we have quality. We have good processes, we've got better processes than we used to have, but we're still struggling, I think, a bit to kind of scientifically, and I'll put that in inverted commas, prove that we're doing well. Um, so to some extent, we're getting these things imposed on us because we haven't had a good enough story inside the sector about how we do it. Uh, David Woodhouse, who was the CEO of Orca, is alleged to have said that the problem with quality in higher education is that Deputy Vice Chancellor's academic can't explain what it is. Um, I don't know. It might be apocryphal, but, <laughs> but I think there's there's some truth to it. And I, I, you know, if you take the the UK system, which I was familiar with, there, there was external examination, and again, it doesn't solve all the problems, and it creates a whole bunch of other problems. But at least it was something where you could say there was a network across the sector which allowed you to cross-reference what was happening in universities. <coughs> so, what do we have, or what are we getting, would be fair to say. Um, TEXA is the major thing, Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency, Authority? I don't know which one it is. Um, anyway, TEXA, uh, <coughs> done already are the provider standards and the qualification standards. Work in progress are the teaching and learning standards. Um, and there was a paper released in the middle of last year, and I've got to say, Ross, not having been to the last DBCA meeting, and it's all still in play, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Nothing very definite has emerged there. But uh, they did talk about process standards and outcome standards, which, broadly speaking, were teaching and learning standards, so focus on what you do, focus on what you get. Um, but that's very much up in the air, and I think Texas themselves, uh, certainly having heard Ian Hawke speak, acknowledge that they're building this as they go along. Um, information standards. Uh, it will be interesting to see what that is, but uh, I'll talk about my universities in a second. And research standards, and both of those things are still works in progress. Uh, I, I recall, I think Denise Bradley might have said this, that TEXA was intended to be awkward with teeth. So there was a, a sense that awkward had achieved a lot of good things, but there was still a concern that if something bad were identified, nothing could happen about it. So the intention was to create a body that actually could take action and could yank the chain of universities as needed. Um, it's supposed to be risk-based and proportionate, and we'll see how that plays out. It is pulling itself up by its bootstraps, as I mentioned. It can pursue a range of sanctions. I, I think one thing I'm not sure the sector actually tweaked was that we signed away our, self, our right to self-accrediting status on the basis that we get more funding, as per Bradley with you. I think would be a quick sketch. Now, you know, I'm not actually too catastrophic about that. I think it was inevitable. 
but we did, with, with the sniff of money, um, we did agree ultimately through the legislation that Texas can take that away from us. Now that, that's a healthy thing, because as long as we behave, I'm sure they won't, but it is, it does put us at a bit more peril than we used to. And just in the last week, uh, there's this issue of uh, Curtin giving an honorary doctorate to the Malaysian Prime Minister's wife, in which Texa has expressed an interest. And I think that raised eyebrows for a few of us, because you know, it's not honorary doctors are not part of the AQF, um, for instance. They, you know, they are an, an honorary award, and it's, it's kind of the, the view that that might be something that they might have a look at is quite an interesting question in terms of where the scopes and the boundary is. Other things, the Australian Qualifications Framework is, is part of the qualification standards. A lot of work was done on that in the last couple of years. In my view, it wasn't the sector's finest hour, um, in that I think a lot of universities got involved late and misbehaved in the, the process of giving feedback to the government. Um, what we've got there is not a particularly clean model, I would say. I mean, you know, speaking as an engineer, I like things to be clean and ordered. Um, and what we've ended up with is fairly messy, particularly at the higher levels. And you know, one of the significant tensions there was really in the master's space about, is it okay to have one year master's? I think there was a strong view from the AQF Council that it isn't, and that that was actually being seen to cheapen Australian higher education. But there are many faculties and people around the place who see markets disappearing who think that, that that's not good. Um, I think I tend to veer towards uh, maintaining the standards on that. My university website went live yesterday. Um, Anybody get a chance to have a look at that? We were very interested to find that we could find, uh, catch a tram or a ferry to our Bathurst campus. Okay. <laughs> 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 so I don't think it's going to be bloody hard work putting the ferry up the <laughs> <laughs> um, But I mean, joking aside, it's, it, it, I think it, it'll be interesting to see how much impact that has. I mean, my sense is that the My Schools website actually hasn't had as much impact as people, uh, as the government might like to pretend it has. I mean, I, it's not been a barbecue stopper around. Uh, you know, the parents that I hang around with. Um, I guess my concern with all of this kind of, uh, these kinds of measurements, and Ross mentioned the, the collegiate learning assessment, is the temptation to teach to the test. And when you come back to think about things like practice-based education, and I'll, I'll mention this in a, a bit later on, but I, I guess my concern is that we don't kind of um, compartmentalise education and end up just teaching what's in the threshold standards. Because the other thing I should have said is that Texts that talk about these standards as threshold standards, as being something that are essentially the price of entry into the market. The assumption being that people will do better, but I guess we'll see. Um, ERA, Excellence in Research Australia, we know about. Uh, another round of that to come. Uh, again, in terms of the perceptions of quality as research prestige, that's, uh, that's an important game. And I worry about that too, in terms of its focus on you know, very high quality really blue skies research at the expense of investigations of practice and professional issues. Um, we nearly got performance funding and then the budget ate it, and also I think because we spent so much time arguing about the indicators that the government went, this is too hard. And rankings, 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 we've got plenty. We probably, I was wondering whether we'd actually got one for every university in Australia, but we have, you know, Shanghai Jiao Tong, we have the Times Higher, we have QS now, we had a ranking of the 50 most important people in higher education. Um, as many as you like, it's a very sort of human thing to want to rank stuff, I guess, so it probably won't go away. So what are the likely effects of this? On the negative side, I think it's going to annoy people. Um, you know, we know that academics like to go about their business unfettered, um, so <laughs> the need to comply with standards will doubtless cause some people some grief. Um, more significant worries, I guess, are some additional inertia in the system, I would think. Uh, we will have to go through some process of, study, of demonstrating that we satisfy the external standards when they're defined and that we're able to show that what we're doing actually does match up with threshold standards or, or um, threshold learning standards. So that will give us a bit more work to do. Um, one thing, I, I'm, maybe an unintended consequence, is actually around innovation. So on the assumption that the, the teaching and learning standards are based around disciplines, um, you know, how do you bring a new discipline into being? How do you encourage interdisciplinarity? This is not a new debate in higher education. It's been there for you know, decades at least, I'm sure. <coughs> as well. But, um, you know, maybe a restraint on that. And, and this thing about the lowest common denominator, I guess, if, if there is an algorithm, basically, which says this is what you have to do to deliver a BA or a BEng, there is the worry that, um, you know, we'll end up just delivering that and not much more, particularly with competitive price pressures. On the positive side, though, um, 
One thing that struck me about this is that actually if there is a standards framework and you can demonstrate you comply with it, there's some safety in that. And that's certainly the engineering experience, you know, demonstrating that you've done all your calcs in compliance with the code is a really good defence. And if you think about the Wyvernhoe Dam story where the engineers didn't follow the manual, they've got themselves into serious hot water. Now, it actually doesn't mean they did the wrong thing, but, but it, it, you know, they've moved outside the protection of the standards base. Um, these are things I think are really good outcomes. There will have to be more explicit thought about graduate outcomes, and having spent you know, some of my career playing with curriculum, I think that's really valuable and important. More explicit thought about curriculum design. Um, you know, some disciplines do this really well, but particularly if there's professional accreditation, but for a lot of them, uh, it is a collection of things that people like to teach, and being quite sure that there's some of that. Um, I always like to ask the question, you know, what's the essence of bachelorness? If you take a BA and a BEng, what's the, how do you sort of distill the essence of bachelorness and compare it between them? Uh, I think there will be more collaboration between universities. In fact, we're already seeing that. The group of eight have their uh, process, having been part of an IRU group before. Again, there was quite good debate collegially about these things, which I think is healthy. And above anything else, I think more focused debate about the quality of learning and teaching because the instinct or the, the psychological drivers do seem to push people towards research. Um, one of the things that struck me is we have had quite significant technological benefits uh, through IT in terms of research, which has allowed us to cite more and publish more. But we've reinvested that in the research side. We haven't reinvested in the teaching and learning side. Now, that's a choice we've made as a sector across the world, and we'd argue we have to because it's competitive. But it's still a choice we made. So having something that really forces us to be serious about teaching and learning is good. Um, still a need for artistry, I would say. Um, so that building on the left is a reinforced concrete building in Grimsby in the UK, and it's very unlovely. And I, when I used to teach concrete design, but this is the kind of thing people design, because it's easy to design to the code. It's got nice rectangular beams, you can do the counts easily, but it's awful. Um, that's one of Dowdy's creations in Barcelona, which is much more interesting, but harder to design, and probably harder to demonstrate with uh, compliance to the code, and vastly more expensive, of course. But um, you know, I do think we've got to be very mindful about being compliant, but also retaining <coughs> a sense of excitement and fun and artistry about what we do in higher education. This is one I think that's not being talked about as much as you might expect, but I, the role of expertise is going to be incredibly important. Again, if you look at the, the engineering example, um, you can't take someone off the street, have them pick up the Australian Code for Structural Design and design a building. You need someone who's trained and who has expertise and knows what they're doing, and it will be the same in higher education. It won't be a script for an idiot to produce a curriculum, but it will be guidance for experts to do it well. So expertise will become really important. Um, uh, and we'll need to have bodies of experts who can agree on that interpretation, and that will be that cross-university debate. So summary. Um, do we have this, do we have this a scaffolders of support or scaffolders gallows? And I would remind you of the Samuel Johnson quote, which isn't quite that, but you know, nothing concentrates the mind like the prospect of a hanging in the morning. So you know, that is going to be part of it. There is some peril in this and we'll, we'll need to be careful. Um, this is part of the maturity of the industry. So it's not just about the, this government or the Bradley Review. This was probably historically inevitable and they're not going to go away, whatever we might like to think. Uh, I used to tell my engineering students about design that there's no creativity without constraint, and I think that's a good thing to, to bear in mind. So you, know, you have to embrace this and, and use it well. And that's the last point. It is important to ensure that we don't spend our time complaining about this, but we use it positively and embrace the good aspects of it. And that's what we've done. Thank you.